Good afternoon. I'd like to thank you all for coming to this briefing, Gaza, one year later, the quest for accountability. My name is Josh Bruchner. I'm the policy director of the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation. We are a national coalition of hundreds of organizations working together to challenge U.S. policy toward Israel and the Palestinians to support human rights, international law, and a just peace. This briefing today is being co-sponsored by many different uh, organizations. Uh, I'd like to thank all of them and hope I don't miss any. The American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, the American Friends Service Committee, American Muslims for Palestine, the Friends Committee on National Legislation, Jewish Voice for Peace, Just World Books, the Middle East Children's Alliance, United Methodist Kairos Response, in the U.S. Palestinian Community Network. Did I miss any co-sponsoring groups? Wonderful. Thank you to all of the groups for co-sponsoring. Thank you all for coming to attend this briefing. We're here to talk about the attack on Gaza by Israel one year ago, the implications of this attack, and the quest to hold Israel accountable for its actions. We're joined by two legal experts, and one eyewitness photojournalist to the attack last summer. I'll introduce them all at the outset in the order in which they will speak, and then I'll turn it over to them, and then we'll open it up for questions at the end. Our first speaker is Imad Mohammed. She is the first female photojournalist based in the Gaza Strip, and her TED Talk on the subject of breaking gender barriers and covering uh, Israel's attacks on the Gaza Strip was viewed by more than one million people so far uh, in just a few months. She is also a recent contributor to the book Gaza Unsilenced. There should be some flyers in here where you can get more information about this book which was released just a few weeks ago. I believe. Uh, after Iman speaks will be Brad Parker who's with Defense for Children International Palestine, or DCIP for short. DCIP, a few months ago, produced a very important human rights report documenting how Palestinian children were affected by Israel's attack on the Gaza Strip, documenting deliberate, disproportional, and indiscriminate strikes that injured and killed children. So I'll speak to that. And then our final speaker is Nadia Ben Yusuf, who's with Adala which means justice in English, uh, the Legal Center for Arab Minority Rights in Israel. Uh, Abdallah recently submitted a report to the UN Commission of Inquiry on Gaza documenting the flaws in Israel's investigatory process and the barriers to Palestinians in Gaza actually seeking redress for their uh, claims through Israeli domestic mechanisms. She'll talk about that as well. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to you now. Hello. Um, today I'm, I'm a photojournalist, and I believe that seeing for yourself is your best proof, evidence, and best way to be convinced about something, or to even form an opinion or a uh, point of view about any matter. Uh, I'm not a politician, but I'm a Palestinian. And that means that I grew up with politics around me all through my life. And for that, I, um, it's mission impossible to be um, neutral. That's why I chose photography to speak louder than my voice and for the people internationally to see what I see on a daily basis in Gaza. Uh, through the last war, uh, last July 2014, um, Palestinians and Gazans became speechless once again, um, facing an aggression, an Israeli aggression against them and an Israeli war that was launched against Gaza. Therefore, I'm going to show you some photos today. Uh, I'll explain a little bit about it. And um, hopefully, you'll be able to think for yourself after seeing this. Uh, this was the very first days in Gaza. 
Um, it's uh, to the east of Gaza City, not far away from the heart of the city. And this photo is for a house that was not directly targeted. This was the aftermath of the house after the neighbor's house got targeted. As a photojournalist, I see we miss a lot of uh, angles and concepts through our coverage at every uh, war, invasion, airstrike that we cover. One of the most important ones are the layers that goes under the everyday headlines, under the explosive headlines that you get uh, on news wires, on international agencies, uh, websites as well. Uh, this young boy in the background, his name is Mustafa, and he was, he's almost six years old in the photo. He was born during the first war of Gaza, and he was diagnosed with autism. Since then, he witnessed uh, another war that was the second war war in Gaza in 2012, and uh, this is his third war in Gaza, where his house was severely damaged, as you can see. His sister was explaining to me how by every airstrike, every time that he would hear explosions happening, every time he would uh, witness anything happening in the area, whether it was an airstrike, invasion, uh, just an, a normal everyday assassination operation, or as you see uh, the start of war, he would have less to say. And by less to say for an autistic kid, that means uh, five words a day go to three, and three goes to one, and one goes to silence. Uh, this is... Um, al Sheikh Rudwan neighborhood. It's a very residential, crowded residential area. Um, it was targeted with absolutely no reason, as every time it would be targeted. Um, this time, it, it's the whole compound got um, got damaged because of targeting one building that you will see shortly. Uh, this was the aftermath on the neighbor's building after the one on the other side that you can see now um, was targeted with um, what they call it uh, a rocket that is launched for direction. It gives direction to the F-16. They call it a warning, like knock on the roof technique. They call it a, a warning technique so they would warn the people to get out just in case they didn't hear the phone ring when they called them or they didn't have enough time. So they give them enough time by targeting their house with a smaller rocket. That rocket, what they don't um, announce is that rocket is as deadly as the F-16, only that the F-16 would flatten the whole place to the ground and affect the neighbor's houses, but it's still as deadly as the F-16. It, it does cause death, of course, and it, it can kill a whole family as you will see in the following photos at once. By the very first week of the war, most of us were in denial, and I'm just speaking from a personal um, angle, from personal experience, most of us thought this is just an operation, an escalation, nothing is going to happen. It had only been one year and a half. We have a, a, a three years date, not a one year and a half. So that's, that's the very disturbing mentality that Gazans got pushed into, where we can't actually accept the fact that we're getting targeted again without a warning at this point, without um, a good excuse. Um, Gaza turned into this abused <coughs> woman that was told it's her fault for so long that we actually started to accept the fact that this is what I did wrong. So when, even though the rockets did not start 68 years ago or 67 years ago, um, when the occupation started, we still believe, okay, if a rocket gets launched and targeted Israel, we're gonna have something back. At this point, no rockets were launched for almost a year, and we still had third war. In this photo, this mother, um, uh, it was a funeral for five uh, young 
guys. Uh, they were um, friends meeting after iftar. It was Ramadan back then, and they were meeting after uh, iftar. And um, to us, it was one more funeral that we are warming up and starting to cover. To her, it was her third son who gets targeted in the exact same way. Not a militant. He was 19, and he was just meeting a friend of his. And um, that's when a um, sanation operation took place. The car got targeted, five people got killed, no names, no big names, no militants, no uh, personality that got assassinated, declared, or announced by the Israeli military. In this photo, it was uh, a militant, but he was a security guard kind of militant. He was uh, securing um, um, a compound that is uh, supposed to be a police compound. Uh, the airstrike air strike took place. He and his colleague got killed. Uh, a, a sister of a uh, murderer, as, as we call it, um, she is the same from the same family as you saw previously. This was the house that got targeted, and because of it, the whole neighborhood in Sheikh Rizwan um, area got damaged. And um, this was known on the media after war, afterwards as uh, Doll House. It was colored beautifully. And um, as you see, the damage is so severe that it's, it's hard to just um, <coughs> rebuild parts of it. Most likely, it's going to be turned down, all of it. Uh, this guy, his name is Iyad, He's, he, he was a newlywed waiting for his first baby, the baby's room, uh, all got damaged. This family is from Al Salatin area, it's uh, up to the north of Gaza, northern Gaza. Uh, uh, Al Salatin area is very known that every time there's an invasion, uh, any kind of uh, military escalation, uh, it, it gets the warnings um, in flyers, in the form of flyers, thrown on the houses of civilians, telling them by the Israeli military to leave, to avoid getting killed. The thing is, these people left three times before, and every time there's an invasion, <coughs> that they ran out of options, they started to camp at the UNRWA schools, and that's where they actually suffered from uh, several incidents where the military targeted the schools as well. This uh, is how it looks after an F-16 targets a uh, place. Uh, this house was targeted by a one rocket of F-16, and as you can see, no, um, there, there's absolutely no way to see anything left of the house. Um, this was from the very first week, so they had the whole technique of five minutes call, where they give the family five minutes to evacuate. Nothing can be taken from the house, of course. And again, this, this is just the destruction of your neighbors or the neighbor of your neighbor house getting targeted. This is a very, um, this was a very challenging day that kind of had a, uh, a remarkable, tragic um, mark on my career and my personal life. This is the family of Kawara. Um, it's Kawara family, nine members, wiped off the face of earth by the warning rocket that was targeted, uh, that targeted their house that was launched uh, by the Israeli warplanes. Um, they had nothing to do with any political movements. They just happened to be living in the southern areas of uh, Gaza Strip, which that day was under heavily uh, fire from warplanes. Uh, this lady is Al Muhammad. She's like the oldest lady uh, in the family. She's the grandmother. She actually was expecting her brother to be visiting them that day. A few minutes before they um, um, start preparing the iftar, like iftar um, meal, which is like uh, where when we break our fast through Ramadan, 
they started doing that and a uh, phone call came, the phone rang. It's a family house, so it's divided between three different areas. It's everyone is um, connected to the other in, with one room or like a hallway, but they are three different houses, almost like no space between them. So one of the houses got the phone call. They had one minute to evacuate. They were not able to let the others know. In her case, she was expecting her brother. She could have called her brother, but when the first warning rocket targeted the place, she forgot. She was under the traumatizing effect of an airstrike, and she forgot about that. So her brother happened to come by the time of the, the second rocket, which is the um, F-16. So he got killed in the, on, on the spot. Um, it was severely damaged, but that wasn't the highlight of um, the um, operation or whatever happened there. Um, the biggest catastrophe was that nine members were in one room, all of them got killed on the spot. Um, almost five of them were um, children. Um, Never again is supposed to be a symbolic phrase that people repeat whenever they experience tragic um, events or tragic catastrophes as war or any man-made disasters in, from that same aspect. In, in Gaza, never again is more of a very desperate prayer that we make. So in this war, it was not never again in the attitude of resilience or resistance. It was more of God, please, never again. That day of the uh, whole uh, targeting of Kawara family's house, it was, um, it was a long day. And for me personally, I maybe that, that doesn't I do say that on my website, but I'm a mother of two. And as a Palestinian, I have to cover the conflict. It's, it's a must, it's part of my obligation. I feel very committed to that. As a mother, I want to secure my kids and make sure that they are safe and sound. That day, I came back um, from covering the massacre. And I wanted to kiss my kids goodnight. I, um, I'm a horrible mother at that. I, I'm never there for the bedtime story. One more night that my mother actually tucked them in bed. That day, I, I wanted to go to this. This is, my, this is my youngest daughter. Her name is Latine. She was one year and a half. I went to her room, wanted to kiss her goodnight. The electricity was off, which is a whole different thing that we have to suffer from and go through is that the electricity, the power is out for eight hours per day. During war, we expect that to be a luxury if we get eight hours per day. That's amazing. We actually barely see the electricity for two hours or one hour, sometimes never through the day. I, um, instead of kissing her goodnight, I found um, her pillow and blanket covered with blood. Uh, it was a very brief moment, but it felt like it lasted a whole lifetime. I looked uh, carefully and I couldn't find her. I was checking the whole room by my uh, phone flashlight and she was on the other side of the bed. At, it, at that moment, I, it kept, I could swear that I thought every single mother I saw saying goodbye for her baby during a funeral. And they thought it's karma. I deserve it. I, I, I've been there. I, I've always covered babies being taken away from their mothers, putting, putting them in a grave, a cold grave, and saying goodbye. And that's, that's my turn. Um, Palestinian, it's obviously a must. Um, part of our heritage. So uh, she was, blood was gushing out of her mouth and obviously she wasn't, she was still there. I, 
as a mother, motherhood instinct kicked in and they just wanted a button to undo whatever was happening. I took my daughter, I jumped into the shower and I poured cold water on her. I just wanted to stop seeing blood on her face. And ironically, thank God that actually worked. She started crying. It was a relief. I, I knew she was still there as long as she's crying. Minutes after, she started to turn blue. No hospitals were allowed or possibly for them to take her in because she was suffering from something internally. They could not see. She was not injured from any, um, like, um, any part of her body that you can actually see and say, okay, she's bleeding because of this. Uh, what happened that day is my very safe place and my very safe neighborhood got targeted with five, um, what we call it, oxygen bombs. And what that, what these kind of bombs do, it's not the technical name, but uh, that's like the name we have about it, is that they suck, it, suck out the oxygen from the building that it would collapse in a blink of an eye. And it doesn't, it's, it's, it's very, um, it's illegal to use it, it uh, along with uh, one million kind of weapons that are being used in Gaza. And um, it, her body could not, uh, following afterwards, we knew that her body could not take the pressure as a baby. She just uh, started bleeding from the inside. Um, we were not able to evacuate her immediately. She was not able to get the medical attention that she needed. It took us um, a week to do so. Ironically, again, because my daughter is a US citizen, she was privileged to live, to have a second chance to even there and live. A lot of kids did not have that chance. I know for sure that a lot of my um, friends' kids did not even have a chance to be examined properly to see what happened to them in so many incidents uh, that happened all through the war. Uh, Latin was admitted in the hospital here in the U.S. two weeks after. That's her voice. <laughs> and um, her bleeding turned into an infection. The infection turned into a tumor, and it took us almost three to four months to be able to breathe and make sure that she's not going to slip away. Uh, my personal experience is not reflect <coughs> on all the Palestinians in Gaza, in, in Gaza uh, but it's actually supposed to give you a, a very a small peek to what it is to be a Palestinian and privileged to have any additional nationality. Uh, I can't imagine if she was just Palestinian what her chances in having a decent life would be. And that, as a mother, as a Palestinian, as a human being, makes me feel it's out outrageous. With this, that was the very last thing I saw from Gaza. I was not able to go back. And I was um, in a position that I had to make such a hard choice, um, where I put down my cameras, picked up my daughter, so, my name is Brad Parker, as Josh introduced me. Uh, I work for Defense for Children International Palestine. It's a local Palestinian human rights organization. We have our main office in Ramallah, and we have offices in Nablus and Hebron, uh, East Jerusalem, and Gaza Strip. So, we have field workers and staff uh, throughout the occupied Palestinian territory. I'm a U.S. trained lawyer. Uh, I work specifically on uh, with our monitoring and documentation units uh, and our attorneys that represent kids in Israeli military courts uh, and Palestinian Authority courts, looking at the evidence that's collected, uh, the affidavits that we collect, the eyewitness testimony, um, and analyze the different trends that we see when it comes to the situation for Palestinian children in the occupied Palestinian territory. So what I'll talk about today focuses specifically on attacks in Gaza last summer. Uh, we produced a report, as Josh mentioned, in, in April, I think we published it, uh, looking specifically at uh, child fatalities in Gaza as a result of Operation Protective Edge, which uh, uh, started
started on July 8th, 2014, and ended with the ceasefire agreement on August 26th. So what I'll try to do is, is add a bit of context uh, to, to Amon's perspective and, and, and her photos and her experience on the ground in Gaza to sort of look and see what the situation is for Palestinian children living in the Gaza Strip. So the first, I mean, the first observation is that there is no safe place for children in Gaza uh, during military offensives. Um, it, what happened last summer is not something new. Uh, this has been a cycle of violence and repeated Israeli military offensives on Gaza, uh, really going back to set, uh, 2006. Um, in 2008, you had kind of a low-grade intensity conflict that, that killed 33 children. Um, you had Operation Cast Lead in December 2008, January 2009, which killed the 352 children. Um, in November 2012, another 33 children were killed in the eight-day offensive. Uh, so this is really a re repeated military offenses on the Gaza Strip, um, compounded by the fact that there's an ongoing eight-year long siege uh, it's created a completely man-made humanitarian crisis uh, where the unemployment uh, is skyrocketing, uh, people have no livelihoods. Uh, it's a very dire situation, uh, humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip that's completely man-made. One of the, the key concerns that we have as a child rights organization is that the population of Gaza is extremely young. Uh, over 50% of, of the population in Gaza are under 18 years old. Uh, around 40%, 42% of the population is 14 years old and younger. So this is, uh, when you look at the context of ongoing siege, repeated military offensives, uh, the future looks fairly bleak without any type of accountability uh, on the horizon. So I'll just kind of sketch out some figures uh, from, from our report. We, we documented 547 children killed between July 8th and August 26th of last year. 533 of these, there are 535 children were killed as a direct result of Israeli attacks. Uh, 12 children were killed as a result of Palestinian rockets falling short or uh, a rocket malfunctioning. Over 3,000 children were injured Around 1,000 children, um, it's, it's difficult to get a firm number on the number of children that were maimed, uh, but it's, it's estimated to be at least 1,000, possibly more. So these are children that have suffered an injury causing uh, a lifelong permanent disability. What we see from documentation and evidence collected from our field staff in Gaza is that there's overwhelming evidence of international humanitarian law violations carried out by Israeli authorities, uh, the Israeli armed forces. You see direct attacks on children, uh, civilians generally, indiscriminate attacks on, on civilians, civilian homes, schools, uh, residential buildings, and then you have disproportionate attacks uh, throughout the Gaza Strip. Right? There was no safe place. Children that fled from their homes, uh, after having flyers dropped, or phone calls, or uh, roof knocks uh, from drones, right? They fled their homes. <coughs> we documented 18 children killed in Umrah shelters, Umrah schools, right? On direct attacks against uh, uh, Umrah schools in Gaza by Israeli armed forces. One thing that we tried to do uh, in this report that, that we hadn't done in, in previous reports is, is look at the, the types of attacks. So airstrikes, drone strikes, what types of weapons are being used? Um, we know children are being killed, um, but what are the means and methods? And how does that comport with, with international humanitarian law? So what we found, based on our documentation, we had 225 kids killed in airstrikes. And so this is typically a case that, that Nadia will speak about and that Amen mentioned. Um, F-16 fighter jet, F-15 fighter jet, dropping uh, 1,500, 2,000 pound bomb on a residential home. Um, 
There may be a military target, there may not, right? The entire home is, is leveled, um, an entire, entire family <coughs> is killed, uh, dozens of people injured, and these were sort of the norm, right? There wasn't any particular area that was left untouched um, from violations of international humanitarian law, and um, this is really what we see is a complete disregard to follow international humanitarian law by the Israeli armed forces. So I talk about indiscriminate attacks, disproportionate attacks, IHL violations. I want to just sort of talk about what I mean. What's the standard? What do armed forces have to abide by? So in international humanitarian law, right, there's two main principles. Principle of distinction, principle of proportionality. International humanitarian law governs armed conflict. It, it's, it's not human rights law. Uh, it actually allows for people to kill each other. Right? This is the point. It regulates the means and method of warfare. <coughs> so these two principles are the guide for how to carry out attacks. Principle of distinction. Right? Civilian targets can never be attacked. Full stop. Uh, women, children, presumed to be civilians. Uh, children have special protections under international humanitarian law. If you are an attacking force and you see a child, the presumption is that he's a child. He's a civilian. He's not uh, a lawful target. If you target him, if you kill him, knowing that he's a child, knowing that he's not involved in hostilities, that's a war crime. It's a violation of international humanitarian law. Uh, it's very, very clear. It's very simple. It's not so complex. <clears throat> so the same goes for civilian structures. If this is a residential building, the presumption is it's a civilian building. Uh, you have to have concrete information that it's a military target in order to carry out the lawful attack. Even if you have a military target, uh, so say we are in a school, it's presumed to be a civilian target, or a civilian object, it can't be targeted. If you target it, it's an indiscriminate attack, it's a violation of IHL, war crime. Say it's a school where uh, Palestinian armed groups have placed rockets inside, right? That turns that school into military object, right? For the time that those rockets are in that school, it can be attacked. It doesn't allow you to attack other schools because there's rockets in this specific school, right? It it's case by case, specific to the specific target. Um, you can't use uh, an argument saying uh, you know, Palestinian armed group plays rockets in schools, so that's why we targeted this school 20 kilometers away, 10 miles away. Right? It's case by case, and specific to each target. Once those rockets are removed from that school, it goes back to being a civilian object. It can't be targeted. The principle of distinction, distinction applies. So I want to just highlight a few specific cases that, that sort of show what this looks like on the ground. So one thing that we noticed in the documentation was the increasing use of drones. This is a trend that we've, we've sort of uh, been concerned about since December 2008, January 3rd, 2009, during Operation Castlet. We saw drones not just being used for surveillance throughout the Gaza Strip, but weaponized to target and attack individuals, but also homes, um, military targets, kind of everything. So last summer, we documented 164 children killed in drone strikes. Uh, I'll talk about two cases just quick to give you a sense of, of what we mean when kids were directly targeted. Uh, so July 23rd, 2014, Rabia Buras is a nine-year-old from North Gaza. He fled his home with his family to, on July 17th, uh, went to a Umrah school uh, that was, was turned into a shelter, stayed there for a few days. The school was overcrowded. Um, everybody was fleeing from North Gaza to these different shelters trying to find a safe space for their kids. <coughs> because of the conditions in the school, overcrowding, they decided to go back to their home to get supplies, to get clothes, um, to get anything that they could to make the, the, the overcrowding and the situation in the school better for themselves. 
So on July 23rd, about 10 a.m., uh, Rabi and his mom and another mother and her child went back to their village walking and they had a cart. They filled it up with clothes, some food that they had left in the, in the home, and they're making their way back along a dirt road in the open air. Um, in, in geographically, this village is located very close to the, the Israeli border fence uh, with Gaza in the north. They were targeted with, with artillery uh, from tanks across the border. All four were injured. When, when Ravi saw his mom fall to the ground, he took off to a, an ambulance that was about uh, 400, 500 feet uh, down the road. As he was running, a drone strike, a drone missile hit him directly, uh, killing him instantly. And this, is, this is sort of a typical case. There's a handful of cases that are exactly like this. You have a child, um, quite young, young enough where uh, there's a, a distinct difference in height from an adult. Um, outside in the open air with an unobstructed view. Drone strike hits them directly. Uh, another case was on August 24th, the, the Judah family. So this was a case where a mother and her five kids were outside in the yard, uh, open air, during daylight hours. Drone strike hit them uh, directly in the vicinity where they were sitting, and four children were killed uh, along with the mother. And the last case I want to mention um, highlights an indiscriminate attack, but it also, I'm using it to show the impact that these military offenses have on kids, uh, their family, and their community. Um, so, Ala Balata is 17 last summer. Uh, a year ago today, Israeli drones, uh, or, or uh, fighter jets targeted his home with Hellfire missiles and U.S. provided weapons. Around 4.30, he left to go out to the store to get some, some, some milk. Um, he comes back to his home. He finds 11 members of the family killed, uh, including five children. He picks up his younger brother. His intestines are spilling out. And this is a 17-year-old boy experiencing this around him. Uh, in, in his testimony that he gave to us and in, in the conversation that I've had with our, our Gaza-based field worker, just talking about this case, uh, you know, you see this child who's now lost his entire family. He has the experience of, of disbelief, shock. He, he's trying to push his brother's intestines back into his body, uh, and he thinks that he's going to be okay. Uh, his brother's dead in his arms, um, and, and he doesn't know how to process it. And this, this is not a, a, you know, a one case. This, this is the experience of children throughout the Gaza Strip. Um, and when we talk about these cases, when we talk about you know, violations of international law, right, the status quo is impunity. Right? There is no accountability. Um, there's, no, there's no ramification for doing anything in violation of international law. Um, U.S. weapons are used to carry out attacks in complete disregard of international law. Uh, the, the trigger for the next military offensive is impunity. It's not Hamas rockets, it's not uh, provocations by Israel, uh, it's, it's none of that, right? And the trigger is impunity uh, because these attacks can continue, um, military offenses will be repeated, uh, and we'll be talking about this until somebody holds somebody accountable. Um, and that's why we're here. So I'll stop there, and we can talk more about any of this or anything else in questions. Um, it's really hard to go last. It's really hard to follow you, Iman. It's hard to follow you, Brad, always. Um, and, I, and I'm grateful for your testimony. I'm grateful, Brad, for your documentation and that we're telling the stories of people. We're lawyers. Are, are there other lawyers in the room? No, great. Oh. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> no, but this is, um, these are human stories. Um, and so thank you for you all for being here and for listening to these stories and, and, and hopefully doing something to answer the question that Brad asked at the end of what, what to do. I think if we can remember one thing, the trigger is impunity is perfect. The reason we're here is to talk about accountability. What can be done? What can be done with these stories? I'm going to start, um, and I'll introduce myself a little bit later, because I, I actually had at the very beginning of my talk to speak about the Kawari family. The Kawari family was, it is a, a case of Adanas. Um, Adan is a legal center. We are a Palestinian human rights organization based in Israel. So it's a unique position where we take cases from uh, working with partners who are based in Gaza, uh, the Atizan Center for Human Rights, Palestinian Center for Human Rights, and take those cases through Israeli legal channels. So that's our main work, is how do you use or can you use Israeli legal channels to hold Israelis accountable for these acts, um, knowing, of course, that that's not possible. We'll talk a bit about that. Um, and why then lawyers continue to do that? Why do we continue to use those channels? And I'll say that in many ways it's to tell the story. It's to tell the story that the channels available do not work, that impunity indeed is systemic, it prevails across the board, and as Brad said, the impunity is the trigger for the next offensive. We talk about accountability because we're asking for non-repetition, for never again, as Iman said. So just to talk a little bit about the Kuwaiti family, because it tells both about the methods of the attacks that Israel used, but also the investigation, which is what I'm going to focus a bit on. So um, you heard the story and you saw the pictures. It was the 8th of July, 2014, a really important day for the people in this room. Um, again, this was a three-story building. Five families lived there. The one, the, the wife of the eldest son, Uday, got the phone call from the Israeli military. So this is the warning. Under international law, as Brad was saying, warnings is one of the obligations of the military. Whether or not those are effective is, is the question. So the telephone was received, then you have the small missile, the small roof knocking, it's called. Imagine, it's called a roof knocking. This particular roof knocking caused the roof to collapse. This roof knocking caused the roof to collapse. So you have, imagine a situation, you have five families to get evacuated, the roof has just collapsed, so the small missile created a huge amount of damage. People who did evacuate would leave, there were others who came back, thinking of course this is it, this was the attack, um, when the bomb was dropped on the boat. Nine civilians, um, killed six children. So Adala and Al Mizan, our partner in Gaza, filed a complaint immediately. So what we do is we file a complaint to the military advocate general, alleging war crimes. And as Brad said, civilian object. This is a residential home. Indiscriminate <coughs> war crime. Um, one of the one of the impacts of this case is that in, in the summer of the impacts of this case of the war, the summer of last year, the UN created this independent commission of inquiry, if you've been following this a bit. So an independent commission of inquiry was created to look into these cases. They investigated the Kuwaiti case, and they said, as they were investigating, exactly as we said, this is a civilian object, war crime. This is in, may involve war crimes. Obviously, they're not investigating properly. They didn't have access to the Gaza Strip, but as they're looking at the facts of the case, this is what they said, the Israeli military, said no need for an investigation in this case. Not we investigated and we closed the investigation, no need for an investigation in this case. The building, they said, was used for a military purpose. That military purpose is kept secret, so all of, these, all of, these, uh, uh, all of this is secret evidence. And there was a roof, a roof knocking. So one, it was a military purpose. We don't, know, we don't say why that was, or who that was, or when it was used as a military purpose, as Brad said, once it stops being used for that purpose, it's again a civilian object protected under international law. So they said, this is an operational thing, no need for an investigation. The second case, July 16th, 
This is one of the defining moments of the war for those of us who were not there, who were watching from afar in horror as this unfolded over the course of last summer. July 16th, Ahed Ahed Bakir, 10 years old. Zakaria Ahed Bakir, 10 years old. Mohammed Ramis Bakir, 11 years old. And Ismail Mahmoud Bakir, 9 years old, were killed when Israeli forces shelled a beachfront on the Gaza Strip. These kids were playing soccer. These kids were playing soccer. It was in front of, if you saw it in front of tons of media, it was in a uh, public beach on the Gaza Strip. Um, this case is, is critical because it shows the failures of Israel's investigative system. And this is what the Commission of Inquiry said. They looked at this case because what happened? This was one of the six cases that was opened. So there was an investigation on this case. And you wonder why, I mean, there was a ton of attention. Do, do people remember that day? Do you remember that moment of those who were following this? So there was a ton of international attention. The media was all over this. They were right there. Um, so they opened the case. They did open the investigation. And then, um, after the investigation, closed. Closed. No war crimes, absolved of complete responsibility for the targeting of these children. They said the attack was, a, was this shack where the kids were playing. That was, the, that was the military objective. It was used for military purposes. Um, though they acknowledged, even in their, as they're writing to the lawyers of the case, that submitted this case with our partner at Mizan, they said there weren't ongoing hostilities. There weren't ongoing hostilities. We acknowledge that. but. It was used for military purposes, and two, we could not distinguish that these were children. We didn't know that these were children. No wrongdoing, no war crime, complete impunity. How did this work out? We submit the complaint to the military advocate general, um, and the military advocate general sends out um, a fact-finding assessment mechanism, and I'll talk about this. This is a new thing that was established in September of last year. This is an independent, quote, unquote, independent assessment mechanism, though it's, in, it's within the hierarchy of the military. So it gets orders from the military, it replies, it responds to the military. This fact-finding mechanism was supposed to go out and investigate. Adela submitted four affidavits, three witnesses, and one 11-year-old survivor. They called the 11-year-old survivor to come to Erez Crossing. Um, we have a, a colleague here, uh, Gerard, who just who's from the American Friends Service Committee who just came from Gaza. Eris crossing. So they say to this 11-year-old ch child, come to Eris. He has no lawyer. Um, his father should have come with him. Post-traumatic stress, 11-year-old uh, survivor, four of his cousins are killed. He didn't end up coming. But they had three other adult witnesses. They didn't call those witnesses. So the witnesses were not called. No foreign press was approached. Um, and so we wonder, where are they getting this information? How are they assessing the situation? How are they assessing the, instant, the incident um, when witnesses were not approached? Um, incident is closed. Investigation was opened. Investigation is closed. That is one of six that was opened. So we have, as we'll talk, Adana itself, for example, submitted 22 complaints. 22 complaints, and we're, we're choosing them for a specific reason. The, the incidents are responding to what Brad laid out as far as what are the violations of international law. So was this a civilian object? Was it a home? Was it direct targeting of civilians? Were there kids on the beach? Was it um, protected property under international law like hospitals or schools, ambulances? Was it media? So these are the cases that we're taking. So we're a legal center. We're also a human rights organization that's looking to, to make an impact. So if you get a good case, if you get a case that experience exposes a policy that is uh, illegal under international law, that's the kind of case we're taking. So we submit 22 of those cases to the military advocate general. Um, only, so we have this response on the UNRWA schools with the other of the five cases that were opened. So the two cases that were opened by the military advocate general so far um, that Adam submitted and that human rights organizations are putting forward are the kids on the Gaza beach, it was closed in June. And the ongoing investigations into the targeting of UNRWA, the UN schools, their UN schools, so these are also protected under international law. Um, 
And so we're saying, so we have these 22 incidents and we're requesting independent internet, uh, criminal investigations. Um, seven of those cases, like the Pawari family, no investigation needed. Nine of those cases were still waiting for responses. So you have concrete evidence that these domestic investigations aren't working properly. And the reason, what's interesting to I think about the way that we work, people often ask why. Why is Adala going to the military advocate general when you know from experience that they're not going to open these cases? What do I mean by you know from experience? Brad talked about Operation Cast Lead. This was before last summer, the largest military offensive on the Gaza Strip. Operation Cast Lead, 2008, 2009. So again, approximately 1,400 Palestinians were killed. 400 incidents were examined by the military. So presented to the military by human rights organizations, looked into by the military. 52 resulted in an opening of a criminal investigation. So they looked into 52. Three resulted in the filing of indictments. Three resulted in the filing of indictments. The most severe punishment, the most severe punishment was delivered in the case of the theft of a credit card. 1,400 Palestinians were killed. The most severe punishment for soldiers was the theft of a credit card. And I think, in fact, what you're seeing is, is the same. And how do we know that that's going to continue to happen? Well, you look at the defense minister. So this is Moshe Ayalon, defense minister Moshe Ayalon. When he's talking about what he perceives to be, you know, to warrant a criminal investigation, he says that if someone during battle committed a crime, not a war crime, committed a crime, for example, looting, rape, deliberately shooting a woman or a child, waving a white flag, not just child, but if they're waving a white flag, that's breaking the law and that's criminal. So he says that's when we'll start the investigation. And in fact, that's what we're ha what's happening now. So what's the only indictment to happen from this war? Looting. The only indictment, one indictment is for looting 2,240 shekels. This is $600. From a house in Shajaiya. Shajaiya was the site of a massive, massive military <coughs> incursion. Ground operation was flattened, devastated, devastated. The UN Commission of Inquiry dedicated pages to this operation and said, in fact, the entire operation looks like a war crime. The entire operation in Shreya looks like a war crime. And what we're seeing out of, of Israel is a willingness only to investigate looting. So, for example, a similar case of Shreya, Rafa. So this is known as Black Friday. And if anyone saw today Amnesty International together with Forensic Architecture, amazing organization that DCI works with closely, just released a report on Black Friday. This Rafa killing, if you remember, 135 people were killed in a massive storm of military ground incursion into Rafa in southern Gaza after the kidnapping and killing of an Israeli soldier. And so they were looking at that and said, this is, uh, this is a war crime in the way that it was handled. Um, Again, the Defense Minister Moshe Alon will say this is potentially operationally problematic, but certainly not a war crime. Um, domestically, what, what else can be done? So we're using the domestic legal channels in some ways to show that they're not working. There were some changes. I, re I mentioned the fact-finding assessment mechanism. So this is something that we go to, say, the UN or to the EU or even here, we hear it all the time. Because on the part of Israel, this is a huge change that they have this new fact-finding mechanism that's investigating the war and we're saying we've tested it we've tested it and it doesn't work it doesn't work it's not holding anyone accountable um, just a few other things about what if you're thinking you know what else is Adela doing what else are human rights organizations doing what else can be done it's all to say very little domestically the Israeli Supreme Court has a policy of non-intervention to these decisions so in 2011, the, in a case that was looking at the duty to investigate, the Supreme Court says we have, as is well known, a principle of maximal restraint in judicial intervention in the decisions of the military. Maximal restraint. So it should only occur in exceptional circumstances. So the ruling is saying that even 
if there are petitions that are alleging suspected war crimes, even if we were to focus on specific incidents, support that with strong evidence, they're unlikely to, to go forward in the Israeli Supreme Court due to this policy of maximal restraint. So the Supreme Court doesn't intervene. Additional barriers, obviously, uh, Brad said, the blockade, if you were to, there's a lot of barriers for people, not even in criminal courts, but in civil courts, say they say the, we have a case against the military for injuries. Uh, so many barriers for, for Palestinians to access to access justice, which is critical for, for again, non repetition So Adana, in addition, as it's doing its legal work, is also working in international advocacy. So we're working very closely with the UN Commission of Inquiry, which issued a very important report in June of last, just last month. Um, I would encourage you to read it, which was very powerful and damning and calling for an end to the systemic impunity that prevails across the board. Um, and we're here for that purpose, where that is now establishing a, a US presence, because this is, this is where change needs to happen. This is where that commitment to human rights and the commitment to an end and a just end is going to be written here. And for those of you who care about this, and I'm grateful again to see so many people here, there's a huge obligation, there's a huge responsibility, um, and if there's any questions as far as what Adela is doing, I'm happy to take that, but I'm also really interested to think together about what we can do, what sort of information you need for us if you're here, if you're working here, um, and um, thank you so much. Thank you, Nadia, thank you, Brad. Thank you, especially, Iman, for sharing your personal stories and harrowing pictures from your work in Gaza. Before we open it up for questions, I'd just like to take this opportunity to do two very brief things. First, I'd like to call on Raad Gerard from the American Friends Service Committee, one of the co-sponsoring organizations, uh, to come up here and just give us a very, very brief update uh, on the humanitarian conditions that he witnessed on his recent trip to Gaza. And while Gerard makes his way up here, uh, I'll take care of the second housekeeping item, which segues from Nadia's comments. We have here a draft Dear Colleague letter uh, that we are hoping members of Congress can send to Secretary of State Kerry, which enumerates a number of additional cases of human beings, of children, being killed in deliberate, disproportionate, and indiscriminate attacks in the Gaza Strip last summer with U.S. weapons. Brad mentioned the fact that DCI Palestine documented more than 200 Palestinian children being killed with F-16s, U.S. supplied weapons at U.S. taxpayer expense. There's another report from another Israeli human rights organization, Breaking the Silence, which documents Israel's wanton destruction of Palestinian civilian property, homes, 100,000 homes were either damaged or destroyed by Israel over the course of 50 days last year. Extensive documentation about how that wanton destruction was carried out with Caterpillar D9 bulldozers, again, supplied to Israel by the United States at taxpayer expense as is documented in this draft letter to Secretary of State Kerry. We have not only international law in place, but we also have U.S. domestic laws that are supposed to prevent U.S. weapons from being used to commit human rights abuses and war crimes. And what this draft letter does is ask Secretary of State Kerry to open an investigation into these incidents, examine these reports by DCI Palestine, by Adela, by breaking the silence and to report back to Congress as to whether the Arms Export Control Act has been violated by Israel, whether the Leahy Law has been broken. So I'm not sure I have enough copies for everyone in the room, so I would ask to prioritize these going to staffers from congressional offices or other governmental agencies that are here today. Uh, so if we could let them uh, take these, and we'll see how many we have left over after that, and for anyone else who would like after that, please do uh, take a copy. Uh, we will be pushing for members of Congress to 
uh, endorse and sign this letter during the August recess and for congressional offices, you should be hearing from your constituents about that during that time. Uh, so let me pass that out and ask Rabbi to come up and give us a brief update. Thank you, Josh, and uh, thanks to all the speakers. Uh, I apologize for being underdressed in all the <laughs> um, I came back a couple days ago, so I haven't really processed all that I've seen. Uh, my name again is Ra'ed Sharrar. I'm with the American Friends Service Committee. Um, my organization has been operational in Gaza since 1949. Uh, so it's been a while of actually working inside uh, the Port of Palestine um, for generations now. Uh, I'll speak about four issues very fast. I think I have four minutes. Um, so one issue a minute. The first one is that the humanitarian crisis is, um, and the war is still going on. Uh, from the Palestinian perspective uh, in Gaza, the war did not stop. Maybe the military operations are on hold, but the, the systems uh, that uh, exist, whether it's the ongoing sanctions or the man-made humanitarian crisis, are still there. The day that I arrived to Gaza, and this was my first ever trip to uh, Palestine, although I am of Palestinian descent. The first day I arrived to Gaza, I went to the hotel, which is a very nice hotel. I wasn't imagining to have nice hotels in Gaza. Uh, but when I want to take a shower, uh, the water that comes out of the shower is seawater. It's salty water. Because there is no um, there are no systems of um, water treatment anymore. You know, because they were formed during the war last year. So imagine living in a city that has no water. No, what salt water comes out of the, of the faucet? And it sounds like a, a small detail, but you can't take showers, you can't cook, you can't wash your hands. Electricity comes once uh, in, in segments, so eight hours, it works for eight hours, and it tends to operate hours. These issues, in addition to all of the other infrastructure issues, are bureaucratic decisions. They're not really um, you know, humanitarian issues or infrastructure issues. The grid is connected to Israel, so someone in Israel can you know, change the amount of electricity that can go in like three minutes, and people will have 24 hours of electricity. Or the water is also connected to Israel. Um, and, and all the other infrastructure issues, any construction material is not allowed inside the country. So the destruction that happened last year or 2012 or before is still there. When I took the tour around this trip, you can see things that were bombed in 2008, 2012, 2000. They look exactly the same. It's destruction over destruction over destruction. And I think from a Palestinian perspective, they don't see these operations as isolated as isolated incidents. They're actually all chapters in the same place. The second point that I want to make is that, um, you know, during my trip there, I, I, I was actually amazed that there, there are, there is a space uh, of social um, um, inter entrepreneurship. There are people are living their lives as well. You know, we hear a lot about the destruction and uh, the negative aspects, but at the same time, there is life, life is going on, and uh, you know there are new cars. People are they have weddings, they eat, they go out, they have fun, um, and these these things actually meant a lot to me to see that there is actual life there, but we don't really see it on a daily basis. I met with so many young Palestinians who have never left the Gaza Strip before. But they are passionate about politics. They want to talk about it and work on things. But it's not easy for them because they're not allowed to go in and out. Which, which leads me to my third point about the going in and out. As a US citizen who works with AFSC, uh, it was easy for me to go anywhere I want, whether uh, it's Tel Aviv or, or Gaza. Israelis and Palestinians don't really can't cross the, the borders. I mean, or any other international people can't without permits. So going in and out of Gaza was the most dehumanizing experience I've, I've had in my life. I've had so many dehumanizing experiences. <laughs> half Iraqi, half Palestinian, who went through a bunch of wars. But you go through this uh, checkpoint, and no one talks to you. I actually prefer people yelling at me than being treated as a sheep. You, you feel as if like you're a rat. You go through these tunnels, 
and there are, it's like 1984. These metal gates open, there's like a small green and red light. And it opens, and you go inside and close behind you. And you wait, you wait like a sheep between these two metal doors. And then it can open in 30 seconds, in five minutes, and they go to the next stage. And it, it was, it was so like disgusting and shocking. I was thinking that like, when you treat people like animals, sometimes they become animals. That they treat you back in that way. It was so painful to go through the, 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 the Israeli part. And you come, of course, inside the Palestinian part, and there are two different waters there, which is interesting to look at the political uh, you know, part. Is that my London time? Um, <laughs> so there's, a, there's a, one checkpoint called the Khamsa Khamsa, the 5 5, which is controlled by Fed. You go there, they have like a document with my picture. They stamped it, they're walked on, this is walked on. And, uh, and then I went for another, you know, 100 feet. And there is another border crossing controlled by Hamas. And they act as if I just came back from Israel. They're like, oh, walked on. And they have this <laughs> other set of documents with my picture, another picture on it. But they stamped. I was thinking, wow, it's like, it's amazing to see the proximity of everything and the infrastructures that are created. You know, I see the Israeli system and then the, you know, Palestinian authority system and then Hamas. It, within like 30, 30 meters, and the way that they to talk to each other is just like so fascinating. The last point that I want to make is uh, the things that we can do from, from the US side. So, what happened last year or the year before, what happened in the last decades, there were so many documented war crimes and violations that happened in Gaza. We, we're not audiences with this, you know, as a US citizen and taxpayer, I'm actually funding not many of these violations. The fact of the matter that we haven't had a single Israeli soldier sanctioned by any of our regulations, including the later law. My organization has been working a lot on the later law. And we're trying to pressure the State Department to sanction one Israeli soldier, one, that has committed a crime in the last 30 years. Such a small task, right? We think there, was, there has been one soldier that has committed one crime in the last 30 years. And we're not asking for like a huge thing to take him to the National Criminal Court. It's about cutting U.S. funds from going to that one Israeli soldier. A very reasonable demand. So far, we haven't had that. Although there are very documented cases, I encourage all of the congressional offices here to get in touch with the State Department to ask for two things. Number one, there are structural issues with implementing the late law in Israel policy. Israel is the only country in the world that we have no tracking mechanism to know where our uh, weapons are. The only country, although it's 55% of the FMF account, we have no tracking mechanism to know where the US put it and etc. So there's no database to check against, even if we can prove that there is a violation. On the other hand, there are so many cases that are documented of violations that haven't been <laughs> taken seriously. So I, I, I encourage all of you, all of the congressional offices here to inquire into uh, as the State Department to have a serious inquiry into the implementation of the radio law in Israel because it will send the right political message that the US will not continue its unchecked support. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.